Welcome to Mini Roblox Mysteries, a mini-series of equally mini Roblox-themed mysteries that were too short to warrant a video of their own. Today, I'll be looking at four small mysteries mostly based around Roblox lost media. In Roblox's infancy, ordinary users weren't allowed to upload their own audio files to the platform, only website administrators were allowed to. This meant that the few songs that staff members like Clockwork uploaded were heavily reused during this time. Songs like Caramel Donson, Wind of Fjords, Nozera, and the Fire Emblem theme from Super Smash Bros. Melee. The only true examples of players uploading audio pre-2013 were the base 64 audio strings that could be imported into Roblox game files with no moderation. However, these were removed around 2008 as they made Roblox game files too large for Roblox's servers to handle. Last June, a fan messaged me over Twitter about an old game created by John Shedletsky, former creative director at Roblox, more specifically a jukebox asset that was included in the game that was later uploaded to the toolbox of free-to-use Roblox models. I remember a game by Shedletsky called Home of the Toastmaster 3000, which contained a jukebox atop an oversized kitchen table. I have a ton of nostalgia for the songs, but I haven't been able to find a working model or source for the songs. I remember seeing this same model in other games, but I've yet to find it. Perhaps you might be interested in checking that out? The jukebox asset in the game dons 6 buttons with cover art on each. 5 of them play a song upon being clicked, and the 6 is a stop button. We're only going to be talking about about one of these buttons today, the one that reads Lives in Charn. The sources of the songs included with the other four buttons have been found in their entirety, with most of them coming from Jamendo.com, a free sharing music site from the mid 2000s. Some examples include the acoustic demo of Rust by No Really and In Aeternum by Two Inventions. Even stranger is the fact that the last song I mentioned does not match its cover art. The cover art is from an album by an artist on Jamendo named To Invention, but the song that plays when it's clicked is a MIDI that was created by Posse Civula in 1998, named The Green Man, Last Act of the Nim. The song also had two different names that were created by Roblox users at this time, specifically Tink and Missing You. Why should Letsky decide to mix and match the two songs and cover arts is unknown. The Chrono Symphonic icon, however, doesn't come from Jamendo.com, but rather from a website named Overclocked Remix, the home of a community of people who remix video game music. This specific song is an orchestral remix of a song coming from the soundtrack of the game Chrono Trigger. The story of Lives in Charn, however, goes much deeper than the other four songs. What's especially interesting about the Lives in Charn story is the cover art used for it. Not only is the image file not named Lives in Charn, but instead that Tales of Charn, which makes it more obvious that Shedlitsky had made the name himself as he was going along with making the jukebox asset. But the cover art seems to be a doctored version created by Shedlitsky himself of the cover art of the 2006 record Grand Unification by Fight Star. Even more specifically, the alternate cover art that was used for the limited edition 7 inch sampler version with the words Lives in Charn written atop it. Even stranger is that the Lives in Charn song does not come from the Fight Star album whatsoever. The audio source can be found and a million questions take its place when you look at the audio ID that the jukebox's code attempts to play when the Lives in Charn button is clicked. The script in the jukebox leads to an audio file named Motion Flux. After some digging, I found out that Shedletsky had tweeted about a song named Motion Flux by an artist named Shinovsky back in 2009 with a link to the audio source. Huh. This song is the same background music that was used in a demonstrational video for Roblox's new explosion graphics, released in October 2007, a little over a year prior. While we do know the source of the audio and the source for the cover art attached to it, why this song wasn't credited while others were, why the names Tales of Charn and Lives of Charn were attached to it instead, and more are currently unknown. 
That jukebox model that brought attention to this mystery was also customized many times throughout Roblox's history. To this day, searching for the term jukebox on Roblox's creator marketplace will yield duplicates of Shedletsky's original jukebox model from 2008. In February 2006, the two Roblox founders made some changes to their user database. At the time, Roblox only had around 200 members, as Roblox had only been publicly available for short periods of time over the prior two years, and with this change to the database, a good percentage of accounts were completely deleted by mistake. Most of the accounts affected were made during the summer of 2005, such as the gap between account IDs 116 and 154, with some affected accounts being registered as far back as 2004, the earliest of which being account IDs 4 and 5. As well, the slowly expanding Roblox staff team liked to swap around the IDs of Roblox accounts at the time. Some examples include the account David.Bazuki, which at one point took up ID number 1, but now sits at account ID 24941. Who these now-deleted accounts belong to is a mystery. For years, people have been speculating about some of the early now-missing account IDs, such as IDs 4 and 5. There have been many theories over the years as to who account IDs like 4 and 5 belong to, such as the very common theory that ID 4 used to be named Fuck. This theory is false, and there have even been fake screenshots spreading around that try to prove that it's true, but don't do a good job of proving it. Besides, the account named Fuck wasn't registered until 2006 when it was later renamed YYC 1052 and deleted. It's most likely that IDs 4 and 5 once belonged to an account like Toolbox, Todd, or some other 2004 account that we don't know about, but due to the ID swapping that was done around this time, empty spaces were left for IDs 4 and 5 with no account attached to them. I'd also like to talk about account IDs 116 to 154 because again there is little to nothing known about them, however some of their names have been recovered. Cat, Absize, and Horsey were all accounts that were initially created in the summer of 2005 that were completely removed from Roblox's database, leading to their names being made available again and eventually taken. When people try to answer this mystery, they usually point to a members list that was linked to the Roblox forums between 2005 and around 2008. This members list does not take into account the ID swapping that the admins did in 2006 and before, as as form profiles did not have IDs attached to them, only usernames, which is why this order of accounts is inaccurate for finding the names of accounts that have been permanently wiped from Roblox. The join dates and other info, however, are correct. This also rules out Eric Castle from being the owner of the mysterious ID number 4 and Toolbox from being ID number 5. Fast forward to 2016, a major database leak at Roblox occurred with the first 50,000 Roblox accounts, including the usernames, IPs, creation dates, emails, transaction information including address, cities, half-censored credit card numbers of anyone in the list who had bought a Builders Club membership and more. What's really strange is that all of the information for these missing accounts had been overwritten. All of them shared the exact same account details with all of the usernames being changed to creator. This tells us that when these accounts accounts were deleted by accident, the IDs were filled up with placeholder void accounts that didn't really exist. In the same year, an exploit was found and swiftly patched on one of Roblox's many testing servers, where a user could log into the accounts that had once had these IDs. The user that got into these accounts changed the BIOS to the phrase Optimal Roblox and logged out quickly after. All of them were last seen online on the same second in July 2016. I originally made a video about this topic in October of last year, however it's currently unlisted as I don't feel like I did a good job covering the topic. 
In November 2007, the Roblox staff released the very first line of Roblox merchandise ever. Instead of having their merchandise in major retailers or on a separate page of the Roblox website, they had it on a cafe press site titled Roblox Stuff For Real, one of those free clothing creation websites like today's Spreadshirt, Crowdmade, or Custom Inc. The initial lines of Roblox merchandise included the Roblox logo used in this era and other Roblox related assets like the friendship badge icon slapped onto as many different physical mediums as possible. Hats, mouse pads, shirts, teddy bears, notebooks, hoodies, and whatever else you could think of. It probably had the Roblox logo and the URL for the Roblox homepage plastered on them. Between the initial launch and line of merchandise released in November 2007 and the year of 2010, little than nothing was was released on the shop, and the shop was promoted on the Roblox website less and less every day. Before two years of radio silence from the Roblox Cafe press shop, they released Christmas themed Roblox merch in 2008, such as ornaments with the friendship badge icon and Roblox logo on them. In September 2010, a new line of Blame John themed Roblox merchandise was launched. For the first time in history, you could get Blame John Christmas stockings, because I know that's what you, the viewer, want for the holiday season. In 2011 for the last time, Roblox would release a new line of merchandise on the Cafe Press Shop based around the up-and-coming Roblox Rally of 2011, the first ever Roblox convention predating BloxCon. Now with your Blame John Christmas stockings and Friendship Badge ornaments, you could get Roblox Rally 2011 gym bags. Yes, they really put the face of Roblox on just about everything possible. And then after that, Silence. Sometime in 2012, Roblox Stuff For Real would be shut down without any sort of big announcement disclosing why. In September 2013, Roblox would open up a new shop for merchandise, this time hosted on the Roblox website. In the blog post announcing its grand opening, the writer describes the new shop as the first ever official Roblox shop. Despite the Roblox Stuff For Real site being advertised all over the Roblox website just a few years prior. When I covered this topic in a video in October 2021, one, I had two main theories behind why they almost tried to cover up this old dormant Roblox shop of theirs. The first being that they didn't want to be managed under Cafe Press, which is pretty understandable. After all, it doesn't do much for your public image as a company when your merchandise is hosted on a free clothing creating site that you haven't updated in six years. The second theory is that the Roblox stuff for real shop was less set up for the reason of making merchandise for Roblox fans, and instead because online advertising wasn't very effective effective in 2007. At the time, Roblox liked to take notes from other companies. You can very clearly see this through a confidential document from the Roblox Corporation from February 2006, which was later released by David Bazuki himself on the 10th anniversary of Roblox. In this, they like to show their direct inspirations as a company. For example, at the time, online games like Webkins were very popular, and almost all of their money came from the Webkins toys that you had to buy just to receive a code to create an account for the game. At the time, just about every popular online game had some sort of physical merchandise Merchandise, so it's obvious that Roblox would try to do the same. For most companies, that method of advertising was much more effective than intrusive ads on the side of your window of whatever your preferred Flash game site is. Funnily enough, this method did not at all work for Roblox. Instead, a lot of the people that found Roblox around 2010 to 2013 found out about Roblox through the abundance of Roblox advertisements found on the sides of Flash game websites. Also, in the last video, I said that I wanted to get my hands on one of the teddy bears that were listed in the original shop, mostly because a lot of my fans pointed out how cute they were. After an entire year, however, I still haven't gotten one. That doesn't mean I'm not trying, though. In December 2011, Haunted USA released his now iconic Roblox horror game, Bloody Mary Awakened Trapped, a horror platformer game based around the Bloody Mary ritual. Initially, the game was split up into a series of two games named Bloody Mary Awake and Bloody Mary Trapped, respectively, before being conjoined in 2012. In April of that year, an in-progress sequel to Awakened Trapped named Bloody Mary 2 Gone would be teased for the very first time. 
At the time, it was only teased through an unplayable game slot on Haunted USA's Roblox profile with the thumbnail replaced by text reading, no peeking. Fast forward to July 2012, a playable sneak peek of the game would be given to a select few people. Two gameplay videos of this preview exist, both being different points of view from the same friend group playing the game. Supposedly, this game was slated for release on Halloween of 2012, but as we know, that never happened. Progress on the game would allegedly continue into 2013 and 14 before being scrapped when Haunted USA permanently quit Roblox in January 2015, and the game would stay private on his account. Going back to 2012, Haunted USA started setting up a riddle to find the in-development copy of Bloody Mary 2 Gone. He even gave a few clues on the Roblox forums, leading to a Roblox account named The Same backwards. Through a path of accounts and games with clues in the descriptions, the riddle led to two items on Roblox, a model by BlueCap67 named BlueCap67's house, and a game by I Am The One Who Goes On. Strangely enough, people in 2022 have tried to make accounts as red herrings to interfere with the riddle. To this day, no one has solved the riddle, and Haunted USA even came back in 2022 to update his bio stating that no one had found the game while he was still active, and that he had forgotten the final account's name. I hope you all enjoyed the new series idea, let me know if I should make more videos like this in the future. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.